So last week for the Retro Review Series, I took a look at the January 4th, 1999 episode of Monday Night Raw, which is went down in legend as the night that WCW spilled the beans that later tonight, Mick Foley, who used to wrestle here as Cactus Jack, is going to win their world title. That's going to put a lot of butts in the seats. And then 800,000 fans immediately clicked over to Raw. And it's a moment in time that over two decades later, we still remember and we still talk about and we still debate. And if there's one thing that can be true, is that WWE can get relatively masterful when it comes to crafting the narrative and pumping out their propaganda. It's one of their real key strengths that they've had over the decades because they, 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 they are experts at it. Like even if you remember the old billionaire Ted skits with Scheme Gene and the, the Huckster and the Nacho Man, and uh, you know, they're pumping up the new generation. He's talking about how billionaire Ted's taken all their talent, like Vince didn't do it in the 80s, but somehow when he did it, it was okay, but now it's a freaking problem. And you get, again, it's about crafting the narrative and pumping out the propaganda. There's been a lot of narratives that have been put out about that January 4th, 1999 episode of Monday Night Raw, and especially about that same night's episode of WCW Nitro. So I was truly looking forward to going back in time and watching Nitro's version of January 4th, 1999, and coming on here and talking about it. It was live from the Georgia Dome, which is a key thing at the time to remember. Like even when you go back to the Attitude Era, and as WWF going in 98 and 99, you know, not every show was live. They had some weeks that were live and some weeks that were taped and in the can, which seems ridiculous to think about in the grand scheme of things now. But back then, you know, that was very much how it went. They might do one show live and one show tape, one show live and one show tape. WCW pretty much did every single show live. So... It was always a leg up that they had on them. It was an advantage that they had. They could react to what Raw was doing with their tape show, and WCW could make some live changes sometimes as the show was going on. They could adapt and adjust, and WWF some weeks just couldn't. Um, and when you go back in time and you watch this show, like to me it's striking just how different the feel was of wrestling back then, and especially with WCW. It certainly had its own identity. It certainly was its own different beast, and... You know, if you're the type of wrestling fan that likes to go back and watch like truly great in-ring action, like WCW is not going to be for you from this era. Like you'd be much better off watching the old Crockett Territory days and the early kind of w formative WCW days, like the late '80s, early '90s. You can watch the flares and the steamboats all day long and yada yada, skip de skip, whoop de woo. This era of WCW is not for you. I can tell you that right now. It's for those that appreciate the drama and appreciate the stories and appreciate the characters and the larger-than-life personalities. Like, this, this, WCW, that's what it's for. That's who it's for. Because you look throughout the night, like, their first match on the show in that first hour. Remember another big thing, too, about WCW back in this time. Monday Nitro was three hours. It was live and it was three hours where Raw was sometimes live, sometimes taped, and it was always two hours. So there was more show to fill, and we know sometimes how challenging that could be, especially when you know what happens each week with Raw in today's WWE and wrestling environment. Um, but you go back and you watch this show, and a lot of the matches, frankly, are secondary. Whether that's Glacier versus Hugh Morris, whether that's Booker T working a quick squash match, the Invisible Man versus Horace Hogan. Now, some of these matches had some story leading into it. Some of them did not. Some of these matches had purpose and reason for happening. Some of these did not, such as Norman Smiley versus Chavo Guerrero Jr. You know, the big surprise there was that Karen Jarrett was making the rounds as a ring horse rat back in 1999. Watch this episode if you're trying to figure out what the hell I'm mentioning and talking about and referencing. <laughs> Perry Saturn versus Chris Jericho. <laughs> you got to see Ralphus going way, way back in time. Back in time when Jericho looked young and skinny. Not whatever the hell he is now. Um, the LWO 
vignette that went several minutes with Eddie Guerrero, like that was a blast from the past, man. Like they, you wouldn't see many companies do that type of stuff now, but uh, this company certainly did, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, you, the, the tag match, Kidman and Rey Mysterio Jr. versus Hooven to Guerrero and uh, Psychosis, like. At least I will say this, like these guys, when they would work the type of match that they did, it did feel different. It did feel unique. And these guys really stood out, the cruiserweights during that time, because, you know, you had so many big guys, you had so many muscle guys, you had so many roid guys, so many physique guys. Like these guys come out there and they flip around and they do all this other crazy crap. They really got over for it as a result. Um, you know, Scott Steiner versus Conan, like, you know, you just... <laughs> I gave Scott Steiner a live mic. Anytime Scott Steiner gets a live mic, you never know what the hell is going to happen. But these were guys that were in the mid-card at this point in time, whether they're associated with LWO or NWO or whatever the case might be. You know, you got Wrath versus Bam Bam Bigelow and Brian Adams versus DDP. Like, I don't want to sit there and talk about all these matches. This is a three-hour show. There were a lot of matches that were sprinkled in throughout, and a lot of these matches, just in the grand scheme of things, felt like they were largely there to fill time. You had two primary narratives and stories that this episode of Nitro was built around. That was two. And they were big ones. It was the fact that Ric Flair had beaten Eric Bischoff the week before on Nitro, and he now had taken control of WCW. He was WCW's president. Eric Bischoff now worked for him. And the second was around, you know, you're talking about eight days after what happened at Star K 98 when Kevin Nash ended the streak and he beat Bill Goldberg with the help of the stun stick or the shock stick, the taser from uh, Scott Hall. And so Kevin Nash is now your new WCW World Heavyweight Champion. Now the whole story around Goldberg and trying to get at Kevin Nash because originally it was billed that it was going to be Nash defending against Goldberg. It's a rematch for the WCW world title. Part of the reason why it was in the Georgia Dome and he had 40,000 people there because it was supposed to be a big show about Goldberg. And, and what I can say is you just don't get this much in wrestling now is how they could take two big predominant stories and carry it out throughout the show. Like it was stunning to go back and see Ric Flair in this spot, like in his in-ring segment with Mean Gene. Was that, that guy that was Charlotte in the background? I'm like, Jesus Christ, at 12 years old, she looked like she was freaking already freaking fully grown. <laughs> It was insane. She looks entirely different, and we all know why that is. Plastic surgery. Um, but, you know, the, the whole thing throughout the course of the night, it's talking about Ric Flair being the new president, and Eric Bischoff got sent to commentary. And for a good portion of the night, he no-sold. He didn't say shit. Every once in a while, when they made a reference to Bill Goldberg being in jail, you know, Eric Bischoff would pipe up and say something, but it wasn't much. You know, one of the other big moments of the night was when... David Flair stepped up and said that he wanted to be his dad's tag team partner um, at Sold Out. Oh, God. Um, yeah, we're going way back in time for this. But that was one of the big storylines. It was Ric Flair now taking control of WCW being the president. And then, obviously, the biggest story of the night was going to be Goldberg and Kevin Nash. Except it never really manifested that way. Because at the very beginning, you have Goldberg getting arrested because somebody's filed stalking or harassment or charges against him or whatever the hell, and you end up finding out that it's Miss Elizabeth. You've got Hogan appears as Nash is pretending like he's upset about it, running out when the cops are hauling away Goldberg, and there's Hogan. I forgot all, I almost forgot all about this stuff about Hogan running for president, entering the political sphere. Well, if one son of a bitch back then would have known about politics, it would have been Hulk freaking Hogan, that's for damn sure. But throughout the whole night, it's the saga of what's happening with Goldberg and the cops. He's down at the station and Miss Elizabeth's giving her statements, but then she's giving conflicting statements. Like, they kept going back to this throughout the course of the night and really, like, played this story. You know, how good was it? Mm -hmm. But at least they did it throughout the course of the night. But then eventually get to a, a moment where Kevin Nash comes out and he decides that he wants to take on Hulk Hogan tonight. You know, whereas Hogan previously... After Thanksgiving, it went and said on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno that he was retired. He was done with professional wrestling, which he knew was total bullshit. But, you know, it's a big thing now. Nash says, it's going to be me. And it's going to be the Hulkster. It's going to be Hogan. We're going to wrestle tonight. Ric Flair gives him the match. And he says, if Goldberg makes it back, I'll face him too. Consider this match with Hogan a warm-up. And, you know, it all builds up to the crescendo of the main event 
of what it will ultimately always go down in history and I think get a really bad rap, and that is the finger poke of doom. <laughs> now, let me be clear. The problem with the finger poke of doom is not the finger poke of doom. The finger poke of doom is potentially a genius plot point in a story. An absolutely genius plot point. Hogan couldn't beat Goldberg, so now he got somebody else to get some help to do it, and now to kind of reform and reunite the NWO, Hogan's going to get the title back. But it's not going to be in a legitimate fashion. It's not going to be in a straight-up match. It's going to be, we've worked and double-crossed everybody, and this was the plan all along, and we're all going to join together. Hogan, Hall, Nash, Steiner. Oh my God, Luger's in the NWO. What the hell is going on here? Like, this is a big effing deal at the time. And man, oh man, those fans were pissed. I miss those old days of WCW. You know, Bischoff lived for the fans throwing the crap in the ring. He absolutely loved seeing those reactions. And frankly, I do too. I understand why you can't really allow that or do that anymore. But by God. Did that make the show feel so real and it made it feel different? And it really added when you did these big moments, these big heel turns, these big shocking things, these things that would piss fans off. The fans would actually act like they were pissed off because they were pissed off. I can imagine if you actually paid for tickets to go to the Georgia Dome that night, you thought you were getting the hometown hero Bill Goldberg taken on Kevin Nash for the WCW World Championship. Instead, you walk out and you get a joke-ass match of a main event and Hogan leaves the champion and Goldberg comes out afterwards and tries to get into these guys and they end up messing them up. That's where the whole Luger joining the NWO thing comes in and they beat him down and they handcuff him to the ropes and they spray paint his head and his body with NWO colors and the NWO for life. And, and it's seen. And for years, you've had to listen to the WWE machine, WWE propaganda, talk about how huge and critical of a night in the Monday Night Wars this was. And this was the night that the Monday Night Wars changed forever and WCW Nitro never beat Raw again in the ratings going head up on a weekly basis. And they've talked about how, you know, re releasing WWE's taped result, WWF, excuse me, his taped results was a really low down dirty trick and it was and WWF had nobody at the time to blame for but themselves. Like it's their own fucking fault for not being live every week. They weren't stepping up to the level of the competition. The competition was going live every week and they were going three hours. Then Vince McMahon's company should have been live each and every single week. I understood there were certain considerations as to why they weren't, but the reality is when you are in an environment where your competition is live and you are not and you're running head to head, they you have set yourself up for the chance that they are gonna give and release out the big spoiler for what you've got planned on a tape show. Like how stupid can you be to do a world title change on a tape show? Like all the stuff you hear about the dirty trick by Bischoff. It was all Bischoff. You got Tony Schiavone talking about, oh, he's going to win their world title later tonight. That'll put a lot of butts in the seats. And they always may try to make that such an evil WCW thing. It's such a bad, sinister, m malicious, evil thing that Eric Bischoff did. And it was, no question about it. But if you were in their spot, you would. You absolutely would. And I don't want to hear Vince McMahon sit there and tell anybody or anybody involved in this company at the time and pretend like if his shoes were reversed, shoes were on the other foot, that WWF wouldn't have done the exact same fucking thing. They would have. They absolutely would have. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. But the reality is WWF had nobody to blame but the fucking selves. You're the idiots that decided to do a world title change on a tape show. And if you're going to be that stupid to do that then I absolutely do not begrudge WCW for releasing it out there because clearly you didn't care enough to protect the title change. And as far as this whole narrative of once they made that announcement, 800,000 fans flipped over to w from WCW Monday Nitro to Monday Night Raw. Yeah, but they didn't stay. Even if you want to believe that, and that's not entirely true, even if you want to believe that, like, by the time you got to the end of the night, yeah, the beginning of Rock and Mankind, and when you look at the quarter hour segments back then, like, it was really good, but it was losing some viewership. And once you got to that 11 p.m. Eastern overrun, like, they blood a ton of viewers, 
who went over to WCW Monday Nitro to watch Nash versus fucking Hogan for the WCW World Championship. And even when you go back and look at that night, like I think Raw's rating overall for the two hours is a 5.7. And if I remember correctly, WCW's was like a 5.0, but that was a three hour rating. And their first hour used to be really bad. And it certainly was on this show for the most part. Like they were trying to fill time. And that, that drops and hurts and impacts the rating a little bit. But let's not pretend like it was the finger poke of doom that changed everything. That wasn't the landscape changer by any stretch of the imagination. Because even as you go through the next few months of ratings, yeah, they started to decline a little bit, but it wasn't like WCW was totally in a bad way in terms of viewership numbers. They were still doing really, really damn good viewership numbers. As you got into later 1999, about the time right before Russo got there in October and then those next couple of months afterwards, when they go from they're doing four and a half, 4.5, 4.85, 4.4, 4.2, 4.0 to doing ratings of 2.6, 2.9, 3.0. Like, it's really hard to sit there and go and say all those months later, it ties into the finger poke of doom. And let's be clear, in terms of pure storytelling, what f was fucked up about the finger poke of doom is that it ultimately led to nothing that was of consequence or significance. That should have been a moment right there where you could have built six, nine, 12 months of story around Goldberg getting screwed first at Starcade and then what happened here. And for months, he has to work his way up through the NWO. Excuse me, he's got to go after Luger. He's got to go through Steiner. He's got to go through Nash and Hall. And then eventually, maybe by the time you get to Starcade 1999, if you want to do it before that, you do it before that. But you could draw that out for an entire year and get back to Goldberg versus Hogan for the main event, World Heavyweight Championship at Starkey 99. I understand this revisionist history to a degree, but even if I'm thinking about it at the time and you're doing that finger poke of doom, like the whole premise and purpose of doing that is that Hogan outsmarted Goldberg. And it was all one big game by and political game by Hogan. And it made perfect sense. It absolutely made perfect sense to do it this way. It really did. But everything after this was bad. Yeah, because within a, was it a month or two, I think Ric Flair ended up being the WCW world champion. I got one of that shit. Like Goldberg was that dude at this time. And I hate when people try to diminish Goldberg and say that he wasn't. That's a crock of shit. I also hate when people talk about, well, Nash was never a draw. Well, to be clear, when you go back to 95, especially in WWF, wasn't really anything drawn at that time. Wasn't really a good time in wrestling, period. But by the time you got here, Kevin Nash was involved in a shit ton of highly rated segments. He did some of the best house show numbers. He did some of the best, like, Nitro um, draws in terms of the total gate. Like, it wasn't always just Hogan. Let's be clear. So again, it, it's that revisionist bullshit propaganda history that the WWE likes to put out and sits there and tries to make it like, when you did the finger poke of doom, you ripped the fans off and you pissed them off. Bullshit. Like if anything, that could have been an accelerant to do some incredibly interesting and compelling storytelling like you had done before with Sting in 97 and the build up to get to Hogan. Like ultimately in that company, everything went to Hogan. Because he was the dude. No oh, fucking Ric Flair. Like, who the fuck is Ric Flair in comparison? Really? Like, seriously. Um, it, it's the fact that there seemed like there was no real plan afterwards. And the execution after was terrible. And as you go throughout those next few months, you can start to see it start to slip away a little bit. But the figure poke of doom itself is one of those moments in wrestling history that everybody remembers. And I say everybody misremembers. It wasn't the finger poke of doom that sucked. The finger poke of doom was awesome. That was magnificent. That was spectacular. And the way nobody really saw it coming, but when you can go back in time and watch and you can see how they did this, you can be like, you know what? Man, if you're writing that story out, that looks magnificent. Like you could start to see what they did and see like, hey, oh, we should have caught that back in the day. Should have realized this is what that meant. Like, this was well done. It's the stuff afterwards they didn't have a plan for. It's the stuff afterwards that didn't go over so well. But to sit there and say that this was the death knell for WCW, let's be clear here. Even when you go all the way to 2001 when they were a shell of even this version of WCW in late 98 and early 99. 
He was still doing 2.6s, 2.8s, 3.0s. He was still getting three, three and a half, four million viewers every fucking week. And they were losing money out their assholes because of all the contracts and everything else that they had. True. But let's not pretend like WCW was a dying product. They died RIP because AOL Time Warner wanted to get out of wrestling. And they didn't want to continue to plunk money into something at the time that wasn't making a profit. But to sit there and pretend like this is the moment that everything changed. It's a fancy, well-packaged narrative. It's a cute story to tell all these 22 years since. But the reality is it's just not factually true. It's not. It absolutely isn't. What happened afterwards is a combination of a series of factors that goes way beyond the finger poke tomb and trying to simplify it into that one moment is complete crap. And as far as the whole narrative of the moment, yeah, WWF won the ratings war for the night of January 4th, 1999. That is absolutely true. But, again, I'll even point to the overrun. Like WCW had three hours a show. It's a lot harder to you know, maintain an audience for three hours versus two. WWE knows all about that today, and us fans certainly do as well. But when you got to that overrun and it actually got to Nash and Hogan, I got to get a monster number. It certainly did a much better number than Foley actually winning the title, and that involved an Austin run-in, and his opponent was the frickin' Rock! And you had Vince McMahon ringside, and DX ringside, and the Corporation ringside. But, from a purely historical lens, this night certainly carries a significant amount of weight in professional wrestling history. There's no question about it. Some of it real, and a lot of it made up, fake, imagined, misrepresented. But it has significance. In terms of the shows, again, to me, it's just a, it's a flashback going back in time of remembering when characters matter, when stories mattered, and you know, you could tell they were doing everything they could. WCW, I don't think, from a week in week out basis, you know, always did the best in terms of formatting a show. But goddamn, they could tell some interesting, intricate stories when they wanted to. And they could really figure out at times how to feature their characters in really interesting and compelling ways. And it was really around this time that where I would go back and forth between the two companies and pay attention to both and watch both shows and everything like that. Like it started even to get to 99. Like there was a period of time where, you know, WWF in 99 and 2000 wasn't always the best to me. It wasn't always the most interesting. There were times where I did prefer WCW or just gravitated towards WCW, even especially once they started falling a bit behind in the ratings war. I'm like, you know, I, want, I don't want WCW to go away. I want WCW to stay. Um, but even going back and watching the show, in spite of everything I've said about the finger poke of doom, genius, again, genius concept, genius idea. Execution post finger poke of doom was the problem. But that finger poke of doom in and of itself didn't kill shit. Because even the next couple of weeks, they were doing ratings of five, five plus. So don't give me that crap. Is what came later on down the road when they didn't have a long term plan and things went awry and they just kind of randomly threw stuff together. That's when it started to go downhill and go downhill quickly. But even then, you just think about a time like this where on a night like this, January 4th, 1999, granted no Monday Night Football to go against didn't hurt. This is also a time where wrestling was really hurting Monday Night Football. God damn. I mean, you're talking about 10 plus million people were watching professional wrestling. Legitimately. 10 plus million people between these two shows. And now, Raw's lucky to do 2 million with no competition. So you're talking about an 80% in, in two decades plus, a little over two decades from that January 4th moment in time to January of 2021. Wrestling on Monday nights has 20% of the viewership that it did 20 plus years ago. That's a striking, striking number. Like that's how hot it used to be and that's how hot it is not now. That's how big it used to be. Like, even when you just think about the cool factor. Like, you had a heel Hogan. You had Hall and Nash and the freaking NWO. Like, you had something for everybody. You had the cruiserweights. You had the freaking Nitro girls. 
you know, go go and look at uh, Booker T's wife as one of the freaking Nitro girls. Like, you had something for everybody on this show. New faces, old faces, big stars, young guys trying to come up. Um, you don't have any of that anymore. But I'm here one last time to advocate for the Finger Poke of Doom. Great idea, terrific concept. The execution within that night was borderline genius. It just didn't really go anywhere afterwards, and that's what really sucks.